Why do lost people like to pretend that they are Christians? Um, I don't care what camp you are part of or what belief system you have or whatever else. Um, you're going to see this thing that there are lost people that like to pretend that they are Christians. Uh, I did a study, uh, did a video years ago on this. There was a guy, Tim Lambesis, I think his name was. He was a, a Christian heavy metal singer. And uh, after he was convicted of hiring a hitman to kill his wife, uh, he came out in prison and he said, actually, he said, I'm not a Christian. I'm actually an atheist. The whole thing was fake. Uh, he was a fraud. So why did he like to pretend that he was a Christian? And millions and millions and millions more. Billions, actually. I shouldn't say billions, but, you know, a lot of people uh, that are lost. They like to pretend that they are Christians. They like to play the game. Why? We're going to go over that today. I'm going to kind of do a part two to my chalk talk here that I did. Uh, have it switched over from that wall there, the, the board that I made for the chalk talk, to over here on this wall here, um, over top of my other banner, 2 Corinthians 5.17 banner. But I'm going to talk to you today, do kind of a part two here as to explaining a little bit more detail why do lost people like to get into these two groups here. Uh, obviously, if you're up here, then you're not lost. Okay, But these are the two counterfeits of true salvation. First of all, let's talk about lordship salvation. This one right here, works salvation, true works salvation. All right, right there. We'll talk about that one. Galatians chapter 2. Go to the book of Galatians in your King James Bible. You know, and, and I just, I need to say it again because I don't, maybe I don't say this enough. Um, don't just sit there. All right, this is a Bible-believing ministry, and you should be coming here to learn from the Bible. All right, um, I'm not the authority. All right, I tell you, I don't just say Galatians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5 says, blah, 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 okay, and then Ephesians chapter, blah, 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 you know, I don't do that. I encourage you to get a King James Bible and look up the verses, right? That is very important. My desire is not to get you into a personal relationship with me. It's to get you into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and have an understanding of him and what he wants for your life through his word, the King James Bible, okay? So when I say get your King James Bible, I'm speaking literally there. I'm not just speaking in a way that you can just kind of tune out and just sit there playing video games or something, all right? And I used to do that back really, really long ago when I first got saved and I was really trying to study a lot. I'd play video games and listen to preaching. Uh, that's not a smart thing to do. You need to read along in the Bible to see if I'm telling you the truth. And if you have questions, you can pause the video and you can read the context. But let's continue. Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Read along. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. In other words, don't put up with them. When you find these heretics in here that are teaching work salvation, there is no once saved over here. There's, they say, we reject once saved, always saved. You know, OSAS, we reject it. We reject eternal security. You see, why? Because they're working their way to heaven. They'll tell you that you need to live a life of obedience and crucifying the flesh and whatever else. You say, well, were you saved? Well, I, I had an experience back then, back there. Okay, if you mess up in sin, are you going to lose that experience and have to get resaved? And they'll say yes. And it's so funny because they'll quote verses in Hebrews that talk about if we fall away, it's impossible again to renew them to repentance. And they'll quote that and say, see, you can lose your salvation. Um, but they don't fail to realize, or they fail to realize, I should say, two negatives, that's a bad idea. They fail to realize that, quoting the verses in Hebrews, none of those verses say that you can get it back. If you lose it, it's gone forever. So then they have to come up with this thing of kind of the Catholic thing, you know, Lordship, Salvation, and Catholicism are very closely linked. But they'll come up with this thing of, well, there are certain sins that are a sin unto death, and there's others that aren't quite as bad and whatever. So, um, you know, there's if you commit a really bad sin, then you'll lose it permanently and you can't get it back. Um, but if you commit one that's not too bad, then, you know, you can kind of get forgiven and you can get back into your process of salvation. 
Yeah. Um, or if you're Catholic, you just say venial versus mortal sins. Uh, crazy. But notice there, verse 4, and that because of false brethren. Don't tell me that, oh, you know, the Bible says if any, you know, whosoever call, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says if any man believes, you know, in Jesus, you know, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So you all got to do is believe. You got to, you know, you don't even have to call. You can believe or call. You can do either one or whatever else. And there's just a lot of carnal Christians. Uh, it says false brethren. Okay. People that pretend to be brethren and they're false. But what do they do? They're unawares brought in. You will see that thing. It is so weird why lost people become obsessed with infiltrating Bible-believing movements. They want to infiltrate and they want to take over the whole thing. You see, the truth of the matter is, right now, the Antichrist church is being built. Okay? Right now, they're trying to push out all the old-time preachers. They'll preach, push out a man like Lester Roloff. They'll push out a man like Peter Ruckman or you know, Billy Kelly. Some, I showed his thing there. Uh, salvation, the thing of the Sheffy movie. They'll push out all these old time guys that told you to repent of sin, you know, that the changed life must follow salvation. And they, they push all those guys out and they say, and they'll try to say, uh, you know, they'll attack the rapture, they'll attack dispensationalism, they'll, all this stuff. Why? They're trying to build the Antichrist church. That's what they're trying to do. They're creeping in unawares. And again, they'll do this, you know. <laughs> It's really, really weird. Who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. These people here will tell you that you have to have a, a life of obedient submission and faith and whatever else. And you have to keep doing these things so that you might eventually be saved. And all you're doing is working your way to hell. You know, can you lose, you know, do you believe that you can lose your salvation? Well, if it's your salvation, then yes, you can lose your salvation. Absolutely. I can't lose the salvation that I have. Why? Because it's a gift that God gave to me. All right? Titus chapter 3, verse 5. You can read that. Okay? Pause the video and turn to it. All right? He saved us, it says. All right? My salvation is not depending on what I'm doing. I don't have to take up my cross and follow Christ and follow the path of you know, whatever. I don't need to do any of that stuff. You say, well, then you have liberty. Yes, I do. And you have these Lordship Salvation, Catholic type people, work salvationists. They have, they come in and they will creep in unawares. Why? To spy out your liberty. That's what they'll do. They'll look for ways that they can prove that you're a hypocrite. They don't see the fact that a Christian that gets saved genuinely up here, saved once, and they're going through the process of sanctification here, the second salvation the Bible talks about. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and then that hear thee. Paul tells Timothy. Another place he says to him, um, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's talking about this. He's not talking about that. Okay? But they'll come up here. These people will come up here. They'll creep in unawares and come up here and they'll spy out your liberty. And they see you mess up here and they say, oh, see, they're not genuinely saved. You see how they do that? It isn't just, well, you know, you messed up here. Are you saved? See, there's no, there's no problem. You know, you're reading about false brethren here. How did Paul know that they were false? They had a profession, I'm sure. How did he know that they were false? You see? Because salvation is not just once. You have to get re-saved and re-saved and re-saved and re-saved. When you're up here as a Christian, you know that I you remember the time that you got saved and now you're living your life of sanctification, the Lord's cleaning up your life and whatever else, you'll meet some of these people here, and they look like you here, but then you say, tell me about your testimony. And they don't have a good testimony. It'll be very shaky, and well, I had a dream, I had a vision, and, and uh, the, I, I went into this place, and um, Brother Jeremy Carter, Rod of Iron, KJV, uh, he has a the whole thing on this uh, Team Jesus preacher guy, and he's going and he's sinking down into the dirt and whatever else, and God's drawing him up and whatever, and that's his salvation. Um, no, there's no cross there, you see. It's just, you're going to serve me, and I gave you this dream so that you can tell that you're going to serve me, and now you can't sin, you see. And they'll come up here, they'll jump up here to spy out your liberty that you have as a Christian. And if they see you saying, oh, well, you know, I fell for pornography again and oh, I'm just so, so just sick of myself. And it just, 
See, a Christian will fall for all kinds of sin up here. You understand? That's part of your second salvation. You're working out your, your salvation with fear and trembling. See, you'll mess up and do all kinds of stupid things, but you'll feel like dirt when you do. And what these people do is they'll come along and they'll say, oh, you're not on the path of salvation, then you're not really saved. You see? You say, well, what's the difference then between what they do and what we do? Well, we look and we ask what happened back here. Somebody comes to me and they say, Brian, I'm not sure if I'm saved. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask them about this. I'm not going to say, what are you doing? Uh, where are you at? Where are, you, are you messed up and whatever else? I mean, I've talked to, to Christians and things, uh, women that are immodestly dressed, and, that, and I've talked to people that smoke and people that have alcohol problems, a lot of people with porn problems and whatever else. And I don't judge them for those things, at least not at first. Uh, I judge them back here. Tell me about your salvation. Tell me about your testimony. Give me your testimony. And if I see that this is messed up, then I'll say, okay, well, okay, you're, you've got all kinds of problems up here, right? That's the difference there. Lost people don't understand that stuff, I realize. But that's what's going on here. These people here will judge this about a Christian. And then they'll call this heresy. You're saved once, they'll call that a heresy. And they'll come out with all this other stuff and they'll say, well, I guess you can just get saved and then live in sin. You see? You can live however you want. You can live like the devil because you've been saved here in the past. That's heresy. Uh, well, when you get genuinely saved, you've come to the Lord as a sinner. You're a sinner over here. You get saved. And now the Lord starts to clean your life up. And you're still going to mess up. There's no such thing as sinless perfection. All right? Not going to happen. But there's going to be that struggle there is what I'm trying to say. And these people here want to pull you out of your liberty that you have, and they want to bring you into bondage. They'll say, well, you know, we need to return to the Hebrew roots of, of Scripture. That's another cult that will pull off a lot of this stuff here. They'll come out and they'll say, let's, we just want to be more Jewish in the way we do things. We want to be more, we don't want to say Jesus, we'll say Yeshua. We don't want to say, uh, you know, whatever. And they get into all this stuff. And all of a sudden they're starting to say, I think we need to be more Torah observant. You know, and we need to we need to kind of be more concerned with the Jewish customs. Uh huh. What are they doing? Take you out of here and put you down to here. And you know, there's there's all kinds of fuzzy gray areas and whatever else where you have people that are up here and they're getting messed up here, and then they get down into this as well. And they're they're I, there's a in my mind, I have different folders. Okay, <laughs> I have people and. You know, I there's my they're definitely saved. I'm seeing we have a lot of fellowship. They're living according to the scriptures. I mean, they're experiencing things that the that the apostle Paul went through, and, and David went through back in the book of Psalms, and the Lord Himself went through. They're seeing a lot of that. Their families are against them. They're having you know health problems and can't sleep at night and whatever else and thing. And they're in my definitely saved file. Okay, then I have people that are just. Absolutely not. No way. They're, they're involved in so many heresies, so much wicked stuff, so many doctrinal errors. The Holy Spirit's just not there. And then I have people can kind of, I have the question mark folder, you know, and that's people that they have a good testimony, but they're either down here or down here. All right. Um, they've gotten messed up, you see. So there you have Lordship Salvation. Now, if we can go to the... Uh, free grace thing or easy believism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Titus chapter 1, which I've talked about these verses plenty of times in the past. And um, it's impossible for these heretics to refute this stuff. That's why I keep going back to it. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and under every good work, reprobate. You see, it's talking about the Jews in context. Okay, it's talking about the Jews there. It's the Jews there. Uh, um, verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Okay, um, yeah, Jews are there in the context of it, but it's just a general truth to anybody. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. So, we go down to this group right here. You see, they come and they understand what they're supposed to say. They can go to some church building somewhere and whatever else, and they can lead, be led into the intellectual arguments of, of, 
um, the general truth that all have sinned. Okay, we get that. And Jesus died on the cross, and the Bible says if you, you know, put your faith in that, if you believe in that, and His blood was shed, that is what was, that's the part that would wash away your sins, and He, His death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, yes, I understand. And, and it's all an intellectual belief. You see, they're coming here as just a regular person. And they get here, and they get, okay, I understand the right things to say now. And then they go into this as the same person that they were before they came and understood the cross. Now they just have a better understanding of what to do and how to play the game. And, you know, I've talked about this with brethren, and, and which one of the two is more dangerous, here or here? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. They're both very, very dangerous. This one, I would be willing to say is a little bit more dangerous than this one up here all right um because you can you can kind of talk to some of these people here and you can kind of say um you know you you try to get them on all this stuff and go back to the cross when it, the way you get one of these people here which i've talked to them is you say do you know for sure that you're going to go to heaven and you, well you know i yeah i believe i will and then they, what if you mess up really bad well then i'll lose it Okay, then it is, is it you that's the author of your salvation or is it Jesus Christ? Well, you know, and, and you can kind of reason a little bit with them. But this group down here, they, when you corner them, they will go and they will study how to answer you. And they'll, they'll read books or they'll watch videos or whatever else. Uh, so I would lean towards this one being the more dangerous of the two. Whatever you want to call them, easy belief, believism, or free grace, or whatever. This group down here, I would say, is the more dangerous of the two. I'm going to show you an example. Acts chapter 8. You see, because this one up here, there is a sense in which these people try to clean up their lives. They're doing it without the cross here, they didn't die back here with Jesus Christ. There's no imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ to get them through like we have up here. But there's a sense in which they're trying to clean their lives up. Okay? Still very evil and whatever else. But these people down here, there's no works necessary. It's all intellectual belief. So they can truly become psychotic, essentially. People with different types of mental psychosis, um, they can carry out or have two different personalities, at least, sometimes more. And these people are the ones, you get your uh, Ted Bundys and, and things like that, where he's, you know, one minute he's a political, you know, advisor, analyst, whatever it was that he did, and he's a rising star in the Democratic Party, if I remember correctly, it was Democratic. And, uh, you know, he's doing that, and he's very popular and gaining, and everybody loves him and thinks highly of him. And then on his time off, he's going out and he's killing young women who part their hair in the middle. I studied some of this stuff, you know, the serial killer thing. He's murdering girls because, see, he had a girl that, that he had a crush on and he, and he tried to ask her to marry him and she turned him down. So then he had this weird psychosis thing happen in his head. And, and he's going out there and he's killing these women. And then he's going back and he's raping their dead bodies. Real nice. What was it? Psychosis. But you see, with intellectual belief and no works, you can get psychotics into this group down here. And there are people in, with mental psychosis that are down here that live the two different personalities. And a lot of times they're preachers. Jack Hiles was a good example of that. He can stand up in the pulpit. He can pound the pulpit about sin and you need to turn from sin and you, you know, and stuff. And the whole time he's preaching, he's got his wife sitting back here and Jenny Nishik, his Deacon's wife sitting back here, and he's having relations with both of them. And all the other wicked stuff that that guy did. He was psychotic. A lot of these people are. A lot of these, you know, Baptist preachers are into this right here. They learn that uh, you can kind of play the game, you know, and uh, secretly you're doing some very wicked, wicked stuff. Excuse me. But let's read here. Acts chapter 8. Beginning in verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death, 
And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, who later became Paul, of course, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they were they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Hmm. You want to join that group? Oh, it's just easy believing. It's just a, just a belief, just a profession of faith. You see, no works are involved. Tell that to the first century Christians. Hey, you want to get saved? Guess what? You're going to be hunted down by the Jewish authorities and put to death. Yeah. And uh, what was Paul doing there? Uh, verse 3, Saul made, and As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. What was he doing? Um, he was creeping in unawares. He's infiltrating groups of house church Christians in the first century. Hmm, interesting. Verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Yeah. Verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Doesn't happen anymore, just back here in the first century. Yeah. Verse 10, To whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Huh? Wait, 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 wait a second here. This man is known as a great, this man is the great power of God. He's a man of God, in other words, and yet it was sorcery that he was using on these people. You know what I mean? You say, well, a guy couldn't come along and use sorcery and, and bewitch people into thinking that he's a great man of God. Sure he could, if he's down here. Absolutely he could. There's actors all the time that play Christians in different movies and things, secular movies. They're playing a part. They know what to say. They'll study, they'll read the Bible. And they'll study their character. Anthony Hopkins uh, played uh, Paul in some movie I saw. I did a review on it years ago and things. It was a ridiculous movie. It was idiotic. Major Hollywood star playing the Apostle Paul. Oh, he must have been saved to be able to play a guy like Paul. Not on your life. Not on your life. Hmm. Interesting. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. Well, he believed he must have been saved. Keep reading. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Notice, Simon the sorcerer believed. Hmm. And he was baptized. And he also continued with Philip. He was a faithful churchgoer. There every time the doors were open. What did he have? Intellectual belief. He believed, didn't he? Where does it say that... Uh, there was some sorrow there, and he came out and he said, Hey, I'm sorry for using sorcery to bewitch you people. Hey, I'm sorry. I've been, I've been coming out as a great man of God. I'm nothing but a sinner. Where was any of that? It's not there. What do you do? Oh, oh, look at this neat show that they're putting on. Oh, wow, this, this healing and all that. Oh, oh, this is really good. And he's thinking in his, in his mind, I'm going to continue with Philip so I can learn how to do these tricks myself. You say, Oh, come on. Keep reading. That's why you should be reading along in your King James Bible. Verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, the big guns coming down in other words, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. 
For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's kind of an issue for the Trinitarians that you know insist on the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I, you know, I'm not going to make a big issue of that. Somebody gets baptized and they say, name, baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Bring up, well, you're just quoting Scripture. Not a big deal. But somebody comes along and they say, baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus. A lot of these Trinitarians will say, heresy, it's the Holy, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Well, you're following Scripture in either one. Don't make a big deal about it. Verse 17, then laid, they, then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Hmm. Look at Simon. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Why on earth would he offer them money? Because um, he wanted to make money. You see, a con artist is willing to put out a little bit of money if he knows he's going to be able to get some back in return. Hey, can you teach me how to sell cars like that? Hey, can you teach me how to make that particular little invention? Why? I want to turn around and make it and patent it and whatever else. I want to make that thing for myself. I can make some big money. Hey, uh, I just saw you putting your hands on those people. I mean, these miracles that Philip was doing are pretty good. But you guys coming out and just putting your hands on people and the Holy good. Hey, man, let me just... What kind of money are we talking about here? He was a crook. He was a snake. And you'll actually get people to come out, Baptists and things, they'll come out and they'll say, I believe Simon was saved. <laughs> Let's keep reading. Verse 19, saying, Give me this also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Give me also this power. I mean, you know, Hey, 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 Brother Brian, um, I'd like to learn how to be able to memorize Scripture like you. I'm going to offer you, you know, some money to be able to give me that power that you... You wouldn't do that if you're saved. You know, you see some guy out, you know, witnessing to people on the street and whatever else, and you walk up and you say, hey, I, I just, I, could you, could you uh, give me that power that you have there? I'd like to be bold like you. But you wouldn't do that if you're saved? Of course not. But somebody that's lost would. Verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Hmm. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart, heart is not right in the sight of God. He was not saved. Don't even give me this. Well, I think Simon the sorcerer was saved. I mean, think about the idiocy of making a, a statement like that. I believe that Simon the sorcerer was saved and you'll hear people say that i believe that simon the sorcerer was saved i think he was a saved man yeah sorcerers boy they're they're uh, they make fine christians boy the sorcerers that just continue on in their sorcery and try to buy the gift of laying on of hands and giving people the holy ghost they make fine christians yeah <laughs> his heart was not right in the sight of god verse 22 repent Therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Uh, you say, well, then, see, he, he was saved because he could pray to God and, 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 and uh, you know, his, the, it could just be forgiven and, and whatever else. He didn't tell, Peter didn't tell him to, to get saved. Yeah, because he realized that this guy's not ready for salvation. This guy's a fake. He's a crook. And what you do with somebody like that is you don't say, let's go through the prayer of salvation again because I'll just con you. Again, let's just make sure that you're saved. They'll, they'll, they'll do whatever you tell them to do, just to con you and lie to you. What you do with somebody like that that's a false convert, you say, you better repent of your wickedness that you're doing. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. That's what you do. Try to lead them in some kind of prayer or lead, you know, to get them intellectually you know, to the belief thing again. He already said he believed. He already got baptized. He's continuing Philip with Philip. He's false. And here again, here's how you know. Verse 23. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Huh. The bond of iniquity. Um, he's still bound to sin. The Lord didn't free him from those sins. The Lord didn't come in and say, okay, take my yoke upon you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Matthew chapter 11. You know, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That didn't happen. This guy's still in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Why was he in the gall of bitterness? What would that have been all about? Because, you see, he had a good little scam going there. He was a great man of God at one point in time, and then the people dropped him when Philip came along. So he had some bitterness there. He wanted to get the power back again, but he knew, he knew that uh, his position had kind of been usurped, so he needed to find a better way to kind of get control over the people and things, and hey, what better way if I can buy that gift of the Holy Ghost? How much is it going to cost me, boys? Come on, let me in on a little bit of that power. Those aren't the actions of somebody who's been redeemed. Somebody who's uh, repented, you see, who said, that life I had in the past there, I was wicked. You see? And here we go. The final proof that Simon was lost. Verse 24, Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come unto me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the, good, the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Just to finish up with that little story there. Then it goes on to Philip going and he goes and meets with the Ethiopian eunuch. But the point I'm trying to make here is verse 24. He doesn't say, oh boy, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I am fake. I've been, there's no repentance there. What's he say? Hey, you pray for me. Huh? Uh, no, you pray yourself when you're saved. You talk to the Lord yourself if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't say to somebody else, hey, oh, please pray for me, okay, that this stuff doesn't come on to, up upon me. You say, hey, you guys didn't understand what I was trying to say there or whatever else. I'll, I, I need to pray about this. I'm sorry if I've offended you, I, but I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk to the Lord about this. And, and, and uh, what you don't say, hey, you pray for me, you say. Um... Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. What are they doing? Mediator between them and the Lord. Pray for me, Father. Forgive my sins, Father. I don't want to deal with Jesus Christ. You see. You see, I can have an intellectual belief system down here. I can come along and I can say, my membership in the church, my belief here, See, Catholics can be down in this group too, you know. Uh, some of them are in, in the sense of they know the right things to say and then they have, they live like total wicked devils. They aren't trying to do this stuff up here. They live like total wicked devils. But they have an intellectual belief of what to do. I can go in and I can have uh, penance and whatever else and just kind of fork out some money there to the priest. You know, and they have all the different things. You've probably seen that if you've ever studied anything on Catholicism, but they had all the different levels of penance and, and you could, you know, rape a woman for so much that you give to the priest and you could commit a mortal sin and you can do this and you could, and, and for a while they had this thing of you just pay your priest and whatever. Yeah. Um, kind of interesting because they claim that they're, uh, the founder of their religious cult is Simon Peter. Um, no, I think it's actually more closely aligned with uh, Simon the Sorcerer. Interesting. Go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And this is where this, this really kind of proves what I'm trying to say. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 through 28. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye, are un, for, ye are, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear out, beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. A Christian comes to the Lord as a sinner, puts their faith in Jesus Christ, his shed blood, the finished work of Christ on the cross. That goes, there's their eternity. Now here they start to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. You see, they're going to mess up. They're going to get out of fellowship with the Lord. And a preacher like myself, it's my job to hit you in those areas where you're wrong and you get under conviction. You say, oh yeah, and you get back on the path again. You know, right now we're reading the, the Pilgrim's 
progress thing, the old story, and it talks about Christian and how he gets off the path, gets knocked off by Mr. Worldly Wise Man, and he gets brought back, brought back on by evangelist. Yeah. I'm not an evangelist, but I'm a preacher. I'm a, I'm a Bible teacher. My job is to say, hey, you watching television? You're off the path. You need to quit watching that junk. It's not good for you. The Bible says I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. You say, well, the program I watch isn't too bad. Okay, how about the commercials? Why would you support something like that? Get back on the narrow road. You say, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I've am i been kind of having some problems with drinking. I've been kind of having a little bit, you know, maybe drinking a little bit more than I should. I kind of got a little bit drunk the other night. Okay, you're falling into drunkenness. Get back on the road. You say, well, brother, I was at work the other day and I got really ticked off at some guy and I cussed him out. Go to him and say, I'm sorry, that wasn't, that was unbecoming of me as a Christian. Get back on the road. You see, looking at pornography, get back on the road. Um, Whatever, whatever it is, whatever sins you're messed up in, it's all about getting back on that narrow road and the life of sanctification. Okay? Um, there's no outward think, thing here where I'm being fake and hypocritical. Uh, that, that isn't there. I'm very open about the things that I'm messed up in. Right there. This one down here, what about this? They are like whited sepulchers. All right? They're full of all kinds of hypocrisy and iniquity and whatever else. Uh, there's all kinds of problems in this whole system here. Again, uh, there's, there's a blending here. You'll see some of that too. Where a lot of this stuff up here is also very much an intellectual belief. They know the right things to say. And uh, I'm sinlessly perfect and whatever else. And yet you look into the lives of these creeps up here. And they oftentimes do some really, really wicked acts some really horrible things, but they just do more penance. They just, you know, flog their flesh a little bit more and, and go right back to it. St. Ignatius de Loyola was a great example of that, the founder of the Jesuit order, okay? He's a sex pervert, and yet he would do all these really wild things and go through all this torture and pain and everything else just to put his flesh down and whatever else. A lot of these Catholic saints were like that, and they'd have these ecstatic visions and whatever, you know, and they're just evil, evil people, see? There is some tie in there, all right? But you say, what about this down here? What, where's the whited sepulcher? Um, you learn the right things to say. This is a real great place down here for criminals and psychotic people to hide because all you got to do is just watch the videos and you can learn how to talk like a Bible-believing Christian, how to hold up the King James Bible and say, I believe this book from cover to cover. And somebody comes along and they say, well, what about this? What about that? And they'll stumble and they'll fall and they'll kind of falter and they'll, and they'll, and they'll think, oh boy, I'm going to have to learn more of my uh, intellectual belief down here. And this group down here is hard to catch sometimes. Because again, they get so obsessed. These people are so, they are psychotic. They'll get so obsessed that they constantly are trying to infiltrate and work their way up into here. Just like this group here. They creep in unawares to spy out your liberty, which you have in Christ Jesus. Why? To bring you back down into bondage again, right here. That's how the thing works. You say, well, uh, could you give me an example of all this, Brother Brian? Absolutely. Uh, a while back, I did a video on Jeffrey Dahmer, the infamous serial killer that was going around and having sodomite relations with young men and then killing them and eating them and keeping parts of their body in his apartment. Uh, quite a sick individual, very, very sick individual. But uh, in studying this guy, and I do believe he got saved when he went to prison. Uh, you can watch my video. I'll put the links at the end of this study to the Jeffrey Dahmer thing because it really illustrates the three types of salvation. Um, let me explain. But in studying Jeff Dahmer, um, he actually went to church while he was doing this cannibalism and, and sacrifice and all this other stuff. He was a church-going, uh, professing Christian, you see down here. And uh, that was one of the reasons why he got away with it for so long. Because here's this clean-cut guy. He goes to church. He's living with his grandmother at the time, in his early 20s, I think it was. And he's church-going. He's a good guy. He's a nice guy. He's kind of quiet, a little bit reserved. But you see, uh, <clears throat> he had an intellectual belief. And I'm sure if you had walked up to him in that church and said, hey, are you a Christian? 
I'm sure he would have said, yes, of course I'm a Christian. Why? Well, because he's trying to hide the corpses that are back at his house, the cadavers, you know, the basically the trunk of the body. He's got them back there in his house, got, got uh, trash cans filled with, with body parts and, and in his refrigerator has got some severed heads and whatever else, but he's a Christian. I have intellectual belief. He knew the right things to say. And that's how he got away with his murders for so long. Yeah. They went to church. They took him to church growing up. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, another big group that you're going to have down here is childhood conversions. They get the belief back here before they can even understand that they're a sinner in God's sight. They can understand their personal sins and feel the guilt and the weight down there of saying, I've wronged God. I've been, I'm a horrible person. They can't feel any of that stuff as a child, but they get the belief, you see. And then they grow up in Sunday school and they go off to their seminary and they go off to you know, Bible college or wherever they go and they get this nice big head full of intellectual belief and boy, they can answer just about any question. But all of a sudden, you start getting up into here and preaching the gospel, the true gospel. And these people down here will start to fall apart. And they'll start to show you, actually, that they are, in reality, psychotic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you know? Well, because the Bible says that a, a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Um, you're supposed to depart from heretics. And yet these people that are down here They'll get obsessed with a Bible-believing Christian. Won't mention any names or anything, but uh, I'm sure that you can fill in the blanks there. All right? But what happened? Jeff Dahmer's down here. He's got an intellectual belief, and he's covering up his real works. He's covering up the fact that he's sodomizing young men and cutting them up into pieces and eating parts of their body and keeping parts of their body and doing all kinds of other bizarre satanic things. He had this intellectual belief here. But then he gets caught, and he goes up to here. And you know, when he got caught, there wasn't any kind of a thing of, we got to interrogate this guy, we got to get the truth out of him. He sat down in front of that police interrogator, and he said, get your pen and pencil ready, I'm going to make you famous. That's what he told him. Maybe not those exact words, but that's basically what he told him. I'm going to make you famous. And the, the investigator kind of went, okay, yeah, sure, buddy. And Jeff Dahmer just started, let me start at the beginning started out, I was 17 years old, I think it was, and there was a kid that was hitchhiking. I picked him up, and I took him home, and I killed him, and uh, I got rid of the body, and he, and he starts telling all these gory details, and, and he, this investigator said he was just kind of writing it down and writing it down and kind of going, this is really sick stuff. Yeah, okay, come on here, sure. And all of a sudden, he gets a phone call from the officers that are on the scene, and they said, you aren't going to believe the, the kind of stuff that we're finding here. Um, this is one really, really sick guy. This guy is over-the-top evil. And all of a sudden, the investigator is saying, okay, I don't think these stories are made up. And Jeff Dahmer came completely clean with what he was doing, and he actually made this statement that he's glad he got caught. Hmm. Came to the end of himself, you see. Broken, contrite, sinner, and the gospel presented. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Are you a sinner? What's Dahmer going to do? Well, I'm not that bad. I go to church. I have belief. He's going to say, yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah, you don't need to convince me. I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. Jesus died for sinners. Come on, Jeff. You ready to get saved? Yeah. You, you mean he would save me? Well, the qualification is, are you a sinner? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Are you a sinner, Jeff? Well, yeah, I'm a sinner. Okay, can he save you? Yeah, I guess he can. And like I said, you can watch my study. Dahmer started getting into all kinds of things. Bible, King James Bible believing. He started getting into creation science and a bunch of other things. He was ticking prisoners off because of witnessing to him and whatever else. And the guy just had this appetite for learning about the Bible. I believe 100% that that guy genuinely got saved. It wasn't some kind of a prison thing of, well, I got saved and can I, can I use this to get out of here? You know, uh-uh, no. Um, and he lived a very tormented life after his salvation. 
Um, again, you can watch some of the interviews, and he says about, you know, it's still there. It's still there. There's this horrible stuff and whatever else. And again, you're going to understand that when you get saved. You're going to understand, yeah, you were broken, yeah, you were contrite, and whatever, and the Lord saved you. But, boy, that, the lust of that flesh, that old man, tries to come up every once in a while. The old ways start to come back sometimes when you start to forsake the Word of God and you start to forsake prayer and the right kind of music and whatever else. The old man starts to resurrect. You understand that. But what happened? Well, I believe the Lord set it up that the, this other prisoner, this black guy, he, he went and he killed Jeff Dahmer. And uh, why? Well, because I think it was the Lord said, okay, you got saved. Sanctification has begun, but you're never going to be able to get to a point where you have a clean mind, Jeff, because of all the horrible things you did. So I'm going to take you home early. I think if Jeff would have been given a chance to take the death penalty for what he did, I think he would have taken it after he got saved. I think he would have said, can I just have death row here? You know, Can we just put me to death? But the Lord fixed it up that that happened. So, why do lost people like to pretend that they are Christians? Um, because it's a great cover-up. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that Satan's ministers appear as the ministers of righteousness. Why? Why would they want to do that? Um, because you can bring people into bondage. Right here. Or you can live a totally disgusting, psychotic life but pretend that you're a good Christian. Oh, of course I'm a Christian. Of course I am. Well, what about this and what about that? I've seen you doing this and I've seen you doing... Oh, you're judging me. Oh, so I'd have to turn from all of my sins in order to be saved according to you. And that, all that stuff... Well, you're dealing with one of these down here. These dangerous devils down here. It's a very dangerous movement. These two right here. So, that's going to be it. Christian, when you start to see this stuff here coming out of the mouth of somebody, when they start to say, you're not really once saved, always saved. You're one of these people that believes in this and you can live like the devil and whatever. Get away from them. Okay? When you see this down here, there's no repentance of sin. It's just belief. Only believe. You don't need to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved or or whatever. You don't have to have a changed life after salvation. Get away from them. Don't let them knock you off of the path that the Lord puts you on after your salvation. Okay? That's going to be it. I do pray that you will take these things to heart, that you'll remember these things. And uh, listen to my advice. I've been in this fight for a long time now, and I've dealt with uh, these two heretics right here, these two groups right here, they will twist the Scriptures, incredibly twist the Scriptures, to bring you under bondage. And they will creep in to your circles, your friends. Uh, they love it. They'll get in there. And they are the most wicked, vile people out there. So that is going to be it. Thank you for watching.